everyone. Thank you for joining us this Friday. I am sure everybody is very excited for the weekend. I am Astrid, a client success manager at Born, and I will be presenting today's The Art of Career Transitions panelists and host. Before I get started, however, as a true New Yorker and having experienced 9-11, uh, I'd just like to take a moment uh, of, um, and I'd just like to take a moment of silence as we pay tribute to the mothers, fathers, wives, husbands, sons, and daughters that lost their lives today, 19 years ago, and all of those around them that were affected. So we'll take about 10 seconds. All right. Now, to move on to a more positive note, we have three wonderful panelists that I am so excited to introduce to you. Our first panelist is Denise Horton. Denise is founder and CEO of Town Media, a new digital platform that connects people to each other through share art, culture experiences, share and art, share art and culture experiences, sorry. Denise is a proven digital marketer with over 20 years of building profitable businesses in the rapidly evolving e-commerce space. She has also served in senior executive roles at Comcast, Starts Entertainment, and Baxter Healthcare, leading diverse teams in a variety of assignments from e-commerce to marketing, brand strategy, and sales. In fact, in her last corporate role at Comcast, Denise led a $600 million e-commerce sales channel and pioneered a number of national programs. Last but not least, she earned an executive MBA from the University of Denver and a graduate certificate in digital media and technology from the University of Colorado. Welcome, Denise. <laughs> Our second panelist is Jezebel Gilmore. Jezebel is the co-founder and chief commercial officer at, of Packet Fabric, a leading network as a service platform. Prior to Packet Fabric, Jezebel was an early stage employee of AboveNet Communications and Akamai Technologies. She also served as VP of Operations at Rome Data and was VP of Business Development of GTT. Jezebel is a leading authority on networking and interconnection and has keynoted at prestigious conferences, including Pacific Telecom Council, Nanog, and amongst many others. Welcome, Jezebel. And our third and last panelist is Kristen Wright. For over 20 years, Kristen has been a noteworthy multidisciplinary leader in the technology space. Most recently, as a senior director of healthcare engineering, she has built a reputation as an industry leader in healthcare innovation, working with Cisco's largest healthcare customers and partners to drive transformative change in care delivery and care team collaboration. Prior to Cisco, Kristen held senior consulting, development, and product management positions in smaller SaaS companies and was a founder of two startups. Early in her career, she worked for NASA, Motorola, and Arthur Anderson, all of which shaped her passion for delivering high-quality engineering products, building businesses, and connecting deeply with customer needs. On top of all this, she holds a Bachelor of Electrical Engineering from Georgia Tech, with an emphasis on digital signal processing and NASA CoA and a product management from Berkeley. Kristen has lived in Atlanta, Boston, and Silicon Valley, and currently resides in New Hampshire with her husband and two kids. And fun fact, in her spare time, she likes to write, paint, play music, code, and learn new things. So welcome, Kristen, as well. Denise, Jezebel, and Kristen, awesome. thank you for joining us. We are so honored to have such inspiring women in today's webinar. Before we start this call, I also would like to introduce our hosts, Debbie Menon and Sumit Grover. Debbie is the VP of Tech Mahindra running the media and entertainment business. Formerly, she was the EVP of the Advanced Imaging Society, which is the entertainment industry organization that represents emerging technologies for content creation. During that time, she helped run a Woman in Tech Award ceremony, honoring 13 distinguished women in entertainment which is where her passion originated from for the subject. She is an entertainment and media professional with a background of focusing on running entertainment strategies, ad tech, mark tech, solutions, and advertising sales management positions. Debbie has also had high held high-level positions at companies like Star Media, Yahoo, MTV Networks, Con and Nas, and Variety. Our other host, Sumit, is responsible for the growth of Tech Mahindra's cable, media, and entertainment business in America. 
In addition, Summit is also responsible for few top strategic global accounts growth as a special charter for the company. After a successful stint of jumpstarting CME business in Japan, for which he was based in Tokyo, Sumit has joined us and relocated back to the U.S. and currently lives in New Jersey with his family. And this is everything. I am so excited to get this started. So, Sumit, I will let you take this over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Astrid, and uh, good luck uh, for your move. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Well, good day, everybody. Hope you and all yours at home and work are safe and healthy. I'm Sumit, your host. And in case you did not notice this time again, the 5G and IT in my name, please do look again and call us for any 5G or IT needs you may have. It gives me great pleasure and a deep sense of honor to host such a special and powerful panel today on our show. From initiatives like Nanhi Kali, empowering the girl child through education to a flagship career development program where stars are identified called FAME, Female Achievers in Making, the inspiring women have always been just around the corner for us at Tech Mahindra. I feel privileged to welcome all of you to the second episode of our series directed and produced by our most exciting business at Tech Mahindra, cable, media, and entertainment where we offer experience, technology, and engineering solutions from glass to glass through innovative people, products, platforms, and possibilities. I promise this was the last piece of commercial advertisement in the event. <laughs> in my last 14 years here at Tech Mahindra, I've had a unique privilege to have four very successful women mentors and colleagues across eight different roles. My career transitions, some of which I failed miserably at, and transitioned out, and some that got aced were made to look so easy thanks to these powerful leaders, now I call friends. And irrespective of where you are in your personal and professional life, I am sure you have mastered the art of transitions. And if you are a woman, then please pat yourself on the back even more because you have mastered this art without making a big deal out of it. It's easy to talk about the pivot plans, friends, but harder to actually embrace all that transpires given a change to one's career. With all the transitions going on in the industry, whether that be emerging technologies or the impact from the pandemic, we need to be thinking about a career strategy going forward now more than ever. This session today will be highlighting many such issues that we are faced with, whether that be a woman or a man in technology or not. Well, that's not what this panel is about really today. Instead, today is about the strides women have already made. It's about how women mother and earn simultaneously. It's about how women are earning degrees at four times the rate women used to earn. It's about how households are looking different, how women are increasingly turning into the breadwinners. Some facts that you may or may not know. Women will need to be skilled tech savvy like men, but increasingly mobile to adapt to the new world of work. According to research from the Salary Project, women are actively searching for new job opportunities, despite over 65% of respondents reporting that they're happy at work, 70% of total respondents are looking for new opportunities. Women have reported higher job satisfaction than men, while 33% of women have reported that they are engaged in their work only 28% of men said the same. According to Department of Labor, 82% of social workers are women. In fact, women represent the majority of speech language pathologists, 98%, physical therapists, 69%, and pharmacists, over 60%. Last but not the least, according to KPMG's Women's Study Report, 69% of women are willing to proactively ask to be involved in a new project. 66% are willing to take a new one that is absolutely new to them. Isn't that astonishing? Well, let's use today to celebrate the wins women have achieved and to look forward to how unstoppable they are. Not only will we hear personal experiences from these exceptional women, but they will also share their advice on how to continue to evolve in any industry. 
We are honored to have three distinguished guests who will provide their insights on a number of topics that are most relevant in today's world. From career pivots to how to reinvent yourself and from your own voice to the guiding star. Hails to the women who forged a path, mentored others and created a voice for those who didn't have a platform. Let's kick it off with none other than our very own Debbie Menon. Thank you, Sumit. Appreciate it. With the audience in mind, while you listen to these topics today, consider reimagining yourself by looking at all of your attributes, not just the obvious skill set. But first, as Astrid mentioned, we wouldn't be doing justice without mentioning September 11th. Where were you when the world stopped turning? You may remember that from the lyrics of Alan Jackson's song. The truth be told, most all of us were affected one way or another. Since we have three panelists here, I want to ask them if they have any stories. Jezebel, would you like to share first? Uh, sure. Thank you, Debbie. And thank you, Sumit. Um, it, 9-11 hit close to home for me. Um, I lost a leader and a close friend uh, that was the CTO of Akamai, where I was working at the time. Uh, I was bi-coastal, and I was actually supposed to be traveling on September 11th, um, but given I had an opportunity to catch an earlier flight back to the West Coast, uh, I decided to take on the flight or I could have been on the flight that Danny was on. He was the first um, person to recognize that um, we were under terrorist attack. He, in addition to being a co-founder of Akamai and the CTO of the company, um, was also a commander that was in the Israeli counterterrorism unit. Um, and he recognized that the plane was being hijacked he was the reason why that uh, we knew that we were under attack because he was the first person to die um, on 9-11. So, um, and I think from that experience, I realized um, how fragile life can be, but at the same time, how resilient that we all can be. And it really helped me um, figure out what my priorities were and uh, let go of some of the insecurities that I had um, because of it. So treasure the moments. Well, thank you for sharing, because I think uh, you just gave me chills. Denise, I know you said that you had a perspective that you wanted to share. Does 9-11 remind you of anything that's happening today? And then, it, then I'm starting to think about the fires this week too. Yeah. Add? Um, yeah, thanks, Debbie. Um, it's interesting that you, you asked this question of us to kind of prepare for the workshop today because just a couple of weeks ago I was with a friend in Colorado and we were just talking about this year and, and I said, you know, I, I, I remember very, very vividly and like in, in my heart, I obviously remember that day. I, I remember the months and the year after 9-11 in our country in the United States as a time when we were, there was so much kindness that we showed to other people. I remember people were going back to church. There was people opening doors for each other. People said hello and smiled to each other on the street or in the store. And there was just this uh, kindness and grace about our country. And I made this comment to my friend a couple weeks ago and I said, you know, I see that this year. I hope we can kind of continue with that. But that is that that memory of that of those months after 9/11 for me was about the grace and the kindness and the caring that we all showed not only to the people that we love in our life, but to just you know people human, human humanity in the United States, people that were total strangers. And I think there's a huge strength that comes when uh, when a group of people does does that for each other, so. Well, thank you. We're hoping to have more of that this year. Yeah. Chris, Dan, you mentioned, it's interesting, she had an immediate reaction after 9-11 and she decided to enlist to serve our country. Now, that's admirable, mm. but sometimes doors shut for a reason. Would you like to elaborate? 
Sure, Debbie. Thanks. Yes, and and uh, and just as Denise was saying, and and um, Jezebel, who made me cry, <laughs> thinking listening to her story, I I did. I mean, of course, I remember like all of us who um, who were there, just every detail about where I was and what I was feeling. But I think my reaction, um, and and I I'm not sure I would call it immediate. It took me a few days to sort of process the situation, but I really realized that. Peace is fragile and life is short and uh, and I needed to take some action. So I did. I went and I took the ASFAB and I went and um, put my name what on what turned out to be quite a large queue of people who were also interested and sort of swarming to be part of army intelligence. So um, unfortunately, they, they couldn't take me right away. I went into a, a large queue and then long story short, uh, that didn't end up working out for me, but I I did um, you know kind of in following that meet my husband have two beautiful children and and as you say I think um, things happen for a reason sometimes and and that was a door that I was ready to go through but uh, but it closed and I'm I'm so grateful that some of these other doors opened and I built some of these other beautiful relationships which led me here today. Okay, thank you. Gratitude is a word that is so important and should be a part of every day. When I was talking to Jezebel about the tragic story that she just mentioned, um, she was basically saying to me that life isn't given. What did you mean by that phrase and how does being grateful come into play? Well, seeing 9-11 and knowing that, um, seeing that life can be ripped away from us so unexpectedly, and you know, going through COVID, did you expect to be in quarantine for <laughs> eight months? You know, straight. That was something. You know, I thought we we planned out for everything, and that this definitely isn't something that you know I thought would happen. And so, from that perspective, I think life isn't a given, and what we are. Um, here to do is to give and uh, as well as to take and be grateful for what we have and and being grateful isn't just you know an emotion and an, a feeling but it's really an intention and a commitment and an action so um take what you need but also give back as much as you can, because uh, what you're grateful for, help somebody else to feel that uh, as well. Those are words to live by, thank you. Kristen, I know that there's quite a few things in life that you're grateful for, but one of the areas that you focused on when we talked about it was about importance of relationships. Would you like to tell us more? Sure. So, so when I think back and, you know, sort of transitioning topics over to, to career, um, not only in personal life, but, but really when I think back on my career and every transition that I've made and every, um, every really positive step that I've made toward my goals has been as a result of the relationships that I've had either with my peers, with my mentors, with my managers, with other people around me. And, and sometimes I didn't realize it at the time. You know, you hear, we talk so much in the industry about networking, you need to be networking, you need to be getting to know people and building these relationships. And I think at the time that sounded all a little bit artificial to me and I didn't really deeply understand it, but, um, but somehow I was able to form those deep relationships. And when I look back, I, I sort of wish I had known this earlier in my career, but over the last five to seven years, I've really, really internalized that and started to understand that and started to really focus on those relationships. And that's what I'm most grateful for. Well, that's terrific. I think we'll all agree with you on that one. <laughs> Let's mm -hmm. talk about career pivots. Uh, Denise, I have known you for a long time. And from afar, I've been watching the career decisions that you've made. And I'm thinking today that many of them were very intentional. I'd love to hear about that, but also if you're so inclined, I'd love your perspective on defining the word art in the art of career transitions. And does that have anything to do with reimagining yourself or let's just say repositioning yourself? Sure. Um, 
So big, big topics, right? And, and important topics, which is why we're here today to kind of share some of um, our stories and kind of what we've learned and maybe some tools that might help all of you to be thinking about kind of the art of career transition as Debbie, Debbie talked about. So for me, when I think about the art of career transition, I really literally think of from an artist perspective. So an artist starts with a blank canvas or if they're I think we lost internet connection. What I'm going to do, we'll get back to Denise, uh, Jezebel, for career pivots. It's a work of art. Um, pardon? Sorry, you went out. You're back. Oh, sorry. Um, and so for me, when I thought about um, answering this question, and I look back on my 30 year career, I'll be really honest, I would say probably the first 15 years, the first half, I didn't really um, think about my career in terms of planning and development. I was in some companies that offered those um, resources, didn't necessarily take the advantage of them that I could have. But there was a point about 15 years ago, I went through a program, a leadership program for women in cable uh, for eight months. Out of that program, we wrote a life plan. Part of that life plan, the first step was to write our life's mission. Mine was and still is 15 years later to celebrate life, to celebrate others, and to live my life with grace. I pulled out that life plan a couple years ago and I dusted it off and I read it. And one of my goals that I wrote 15 years ago was to launch a startup, launch my own business. And I really started thinking about why hadn't I taken any steps? And um, and, and so that was kind of the precursor a couple of years ago to me launching Town Media um, in early August. The art of career transition for me has been being really thoughtful about what I'm, I'm passionate about, what I have fun doing. Um, I've really been thoughtful about um, the kind of the pillars of what gets me out of bed every morning, which is I love to learn, I love change. And so I've been very thoughtful about things like 15 years ago, I was in traditional marketing um, back in the early 2000s when e-commerce was really taking off and I did not have digital skill sets at all. Uh, and University of Colorado launched a program in digital media and technology and I signed up to be in that program you know, 48 years old, and my classmates had all just graduated from an undergrad at CU Boulder. And I learned Java, HTML, CSS. I'm as a marketer, I was a total fish out of water. And I will be honest, my classmates were really much better and more successful in the program than I was, but I learned so much from them. Um, and so for me, it really, the pillars have been, um, again, kind of going back to um, the idea of art is being uh, really aware of the things that, um, you know, drives kind of a big, big word, kind of a strong word, but the things that um, make you happy, uh, that you want to be paid for, that you want to spend 40, 60, 80 hours a week doing, um, thinking about, as, as Kristen pointed out, the relationships you have, that other pillar of relationships of people that you can learn from and tap into their advice. And then finally, looking at um, what that ideal or interesting role might be in three to five years, you might not be ready for it now, but to start laying the groundwork, which is again, kind of the black, back to the blank canvas of an artist, right? is they stare at a blank canvas, they have a vision, and then they start over time. And in some cases, artists can take years um, to paint or sculpt, and they have this, you know, kind of amazing outcome. And so um, uh, there were a couple of, of quick resources I would also share, Debbie, that might be helpful for the folks attending today. Um, there's a book that I found a couple years ago um, that is written by an artist who lives in San Francisco, but she was a user experience designer for Uber and Medium early in her career. And her passion though was art. And I won't tell you her story because 
just the book takes about an hour to read. It's really a quick read, but it's called The Crossroads of Should and Must, uh, Find and Follow Your Passion. And her name is L. Luna, L-U-N-A. She's illustrated the whole book. Um, terrific resource. And for me, it's kind of been a guidepost for me um, throughout the last couple of years. And then the second book I would offer as a tool um, that was actually given to us by the president of Comcast um, at an executive meeting a couple of years ago is called The Long View, uh, Career Strategies to Start Strong, Reach High, and Go Far. And it's written by a gentleman, uh, Brian Featherstone Ha, who's the chief talent officer for Ogilvy worldwide. Um, that, uh, that book is an amazing uh, template for anybody thinking about career transition as it's basically three chapters. So the start strong is the first part or chapter one of your career. The reach high is chapter two, the middle part of your career as you're advancing in senior leadership or launching a startup. And the go far is chapter three, uh, which is the chapter I'm in. And so you can literally pick kind of where you are in your career path. And he has some terrific resources too on his website. So anyway. well, that was super helpful. And um, Denise, I think you were going to uh, mention it on your LinkedIn profile. So if anyone wants to connect with her on LinkedIn, yep. So. So give you the information. Thank you. Uh, Isabel, so you, speaking of art and sculpture, by the way, she <laughs> is an artist. Uh, she started working at a law firm and she was also studying fine arts at a university. Uh, she then did a pivot into operations and business development. Now she owns her own company as a co-founder. And I would say that that defines what reinvention is, right? And you've done it a few times in your career. And you also, I think, are in a very good position here to tell us about the art behind career transitions. I was just wondering if you could elaborate a bit. Well, thank you, <laughs> Debbie. You know, career transition isn't always something that I, uh, I drove, uh, especially at the beginning. You know, I chose art because I'm passionate about art and I love art. It helps me to be who I am. Um, but you know, there's a realist aspect of life. You know, I, um, I, I love art, but art isn't a great way of making a living. And so <laughs> I realized I needed to get out of my parents' roof and you know support myself and make a life of my own. So as I was saying that I started working um, at a law firm and after spending a while there, I realized that uh, being an attorney where, you know, working in a law firm isn't what I'm looking for. So what I was looking to do um, is I took a very uh, drastic change, which is I uh, went from having a great paying job uh, in a law firm uh, to not having a job at all. I left and uh, trying to find myself in doing something new. And one of the customers that I had as a firm uh, actually reached out and said, I really enjoyed working with you. And I'm starting a new company where I have a company that I started in technology. Would you like to come and work with us? And you know, from my perspective, it was so different than anything I had done. So it took courage. Um, I think that's that's really is something that everyone who's looking for uh, a career change needs to have the courage in doing something new, something different that you don't know, and also the resiliency um, in keep doing it just because you're not successful at it the first time around, don't give up. You know, it, I think there's a 10,000 hour rule for, you know, being good at something. Don't give up, you know, 5,000 hours into it and thinking, oh, this is, I'm not cut out for this. Um, if you're passionate about it, then keep at it. You will get good at it. Practice may not make perfect, but makes better. Well, thank you. Uh, my tennis coach was telling me that the other day. Don't give up. <laughs> that is, that's really important. 
I'm going to move to Kristen really quickly. You had mentioned to me that you really uh, did not map out your career, uh, but what you did is you were in search of your North Star. And while you were sort of reaching to new heights, were you open to other opportunities along the way, or were you just on a trajectory to get to your North Star? Yeah, absolutely, Debbie. I was open to other opportunities. I, I think that's one of the, and, and I think everybody's different in how they approach career. And, and I think for me, um, I rarely approach anything in life linearly. Um, and for me, I, I needed, I needed that, what I call my North star, which is I've always known. And I, I've always known since I was a little kid that I wanted to be some sort of general manager, entrepreneur. I was attending entrepreneurship seminars when I was 10, um, getting strange looks from, from the adults on who is this kid attending here? Um, but I, I knew that's what I wanted, but I didn't quite know how to get there. But as I was learning about it, I came to understand that for where I wanted to be it, number one, it was multidisciplinary. And number two, you really needed to, um, uh, to, to not necessarily specialize at a 10,000 hour level, but you really needed to go deep enough to have a deep understanding of sort of every part of a business that you wanted to lead or manage. So, so the way I've approached my career with that in mind is that I, looking at my North Star, any opportunity that came to me, or in some cases I created, or in some cases was sort of accidental, we all have those times when we just need to roll up our sleeves and pay the bills. Um, the way I looked at it was, is this an opportunity for me to um, either make a linear step forward toward that North Star or to learn something that would help me sort of build out that capability and talent stack um, and, and give me a different lens on the business or give me a different, a deeper understanding of, of some aspect of it. So, so because of that, I have taken a lot of different roles I've been in software development, I've been in product management and human resources and, um, and healthcare, <laughs> right? Different domains. I've been in governments. I've started a couple of companies, learned how difficult that was. So Desabel, kudos um, to you and Denise both for, for really taking that on and moving that ball forward because it is hard. Uh, but, but the willingness to, um, to try those different things at different times in your life and also to know where you are in your personal life. I think it's very important to know sort of what you can handle and what you can embrace and what you wanna do at given what's going on uh, holistically in your life. So I've definitely sort of navigated um, an interesting path, but but always with that goal in mind of that North Star that that I'm working toward. Let's keep talking about that North Star for a minute. Let's now think about corporate America versus a small company or a startup, really. There's three different guests here today that have all had various experiences in that area. Now, being a woman working in technology at a large company or a small company, there's different nuances that go on. Now, Krista, she just said to you, she's always been kind of looking at this North Star and she feels like she's found that finally uh, in her role currently today at Cisco, but she's actually had quite a few different jobs at one company and it was corporate America. And I was wondering if you could give us a little advice uh, to others here on career transitions within one company. Sure, sure. Um, so. So I think the um, you know the benefit of being in a smaller company or a startup is one of the benefits is that you wear a lot of different hats. So you learn a lot of a lot of different things. I think when you're when you're in a large company or large corporation or other type of organization, there are also benefits. Um, the roles tend to be to be more stratified, but um, but there's really opportunity to to move across different roles and to move within the organization. And I I think if um, one of the sort of nuances in doing that that's a little bit tricky but very worthy is to really think about your your skill sets differently. So um, not only if you're an engineer or a developer um, or a customer service engineer, if you have uh, if you have a set of skills that are, let's say, um, analytical skills, troubleshooting skills, and uh, in customer empathy or, or how to work with customers, and you want to move within a large organization, you can find other roles within that organization that leverage that skill set. So imagine you wanted to move from a role like a customer service engineer into, say, a business analyst role. 
um, you can really start to think about how those skills might translate. Maybe in a business analyst role, you, you're still leveraging analyst um, analytical skills, troubleshooting skills, and you still need com customer empathy, but your customer is a different customer. Equally in HR, it's just, you know, you can imagine sort of recasting that capability set, start abstracting your skill set a little bit, think about a capability set, and then what exciting new ideas and new lenses you could bring to a different organization in the company, sell that a little bit, find an advocate in those organizations, um, and then and then don't be afraid to uh, to make the move. You can always go back. You know what? Bringing in the media and entertainment business for a minute as an actor, there's plenty of people out there that get typecast, right? For one role. Yeah. Saying is you have to reimagine yourself and change that typecast and be open to new opportunities. I, I look at it as if, you know, maybe you have five very important set of skills, but you could probably add in 50 others. So you can kind of reinvent mm -hmm. yourself at one company multiple times. Plus, mm -hmm. even if you don't have the skill set, you can learn it. Look, look what Denise did. She went back to school and she went back to school with 23 year olds. I love that. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you for that. I'm going to jump to Jezebel for a minute and talk a little bit about the culture and packet fabric. And what I have noticed, because I, I know a little bit about your company, that there's a lot of women that are attracted to work there. And the question is, is why? What environment have you instilled there with your leadership that will bring these women to packet fabric? Um, in, <laughs> um, I, I enjoy working at packet fabric. I think there's a uh, in my personal opinion, there's three C's uh, <laughs> and uh, um, the gemstones, right? <laughs> um, that are um, compassion, um, curiosity, and courage, right? It takes um, compassion, empathy to um, work with others, uh, whether that is someone uh, in a different discipline or someone at a different level. Um, or a customer um, or vendor, you have to um, be able to see from someone else's perspective and to be effective. And I think we talked about courage earlier, you know, to, to be able to um, take on new opportunities and to do things that you haven't done or uh, change the world, you know, being in being an entrepreneur in the discipline that we're in at Packet Fabric, we are challenging, we're a disruptor, we're challenging uh, a multi-trillion dollar industry that is telecom. And, you know, seeing things can be done better, differently, and um, and having that belief in not just our vision, but our team, and that we can make the world better um, with our vision. And really curiosity, because I think everyone here knows the world is ever changing. And from our perspective, when we started the company five years ago, the vision for the company is drastically different than it is today. And why is that? Because we're curious. We don't just, you know, create ideas in the echo chamber. We don't just hear ourselves where they are listening to what other people have to say and trying to figure out new ways how to do something better. And I think all of that together brings people with passion and drive um, to come and wanting to do something for themselves and to be themselves and to be different, to do something um, better for the world. I love the three C's. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> Denise, you're somebody who's been in corporate America for over 30 years, and then you decided to launch your own startup. Right. Well, that's not an easy thing to do. I'm sure you had a journey, but I was wondering if you could give advice if someone else was in a position today to think, well, wait a minute, what if I did something on my own? What, what advice would you give them? Um, I would... Uh really spend time thinking again about um, what you are, if you have an idea, but what you're passionate about. Um, look at the landscape of the industry that you have your idea in, both in terms of 
who the a is there a need for from a consumer perspective or a business b2b perspective is there a need is there an un, unmet need what does the competitive set look like and to what Jezebel talked about her company five years ago today now has a very different approach and mission um, because of curiosity, because of courage. Um, but I think that um, the one thing that I would kind of add in that maybe answers this question in a, in a bit of a different way, I just want to kind of add to something Kristen was talking about earlier. Um, I spent 30 years in corporate America. It was a great experience. I built amazing relationships, got to work on really great product launches and go-to-market campaigns and the resources in corporate are so incredible. My last five years at Comcast was the best experience of my, of my corporate career. The one thing that I would encourage anyone to do is you're thinking about like, what are the steps, the projects you might need to take or to take on if you're in corporate and you want to stay uh, in, in that company or go into another corporation. I encourage you if you have an idea, I loved the employees on the team or even employees that work for other managers who would walk in the door and say, I have an idea. And in corporate, I don't know that a lot enough people do that. I think because people feel like they're in their swim lane, right? They're in HR or they're in e-commerce or they're in engineering. Um, engineers to me are some of the most creative people I ever worked with. So I would encourage you, again, on the corporate side, have an idea, put it out there. A, it could really help your company be successful. B, it can be one of your stepping stones to take that to start transitioning your career. Don't be afraid to try that. Um, you know, it's almost as if you're thinking like as an entrepreneur. Yeah. There's a lot of companies in corporate America that love to have people there that think like that. But yeah. When you're starting your own company, you need to be one <laughs> for you sure. You do. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you for that. Um, we have about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to kind of jump through some of these questions here. And I wanted to take a minute to get get personal. Let's find out, you know, who is Jezebel and Denise and Kristen. And our our drive comes from somewhere. And for me, it's always interesting to know where the root came from. Now, Jezebel, your accomplishments are very impressive and you definitely are inspirational and you've got a lot of confidence and I'd love to hear where that came from. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's even though I appear confident and, and I am most of the time, uh, I think there's always a little bit of insecurity and everybody have their share of the imposter syndrome and what I would say is that I grew up with my grandparents because my mom, uh, I grew up in China and my mom left China to come to, the, to America to study, to pursue higher education, which is something that, um, you know, I believe in as well. Pursue your dream, uh, no matter how hard it seems. And so that's one. And the other is that my grandmom, um, who's a mother of five, and she was also a librarian at the same time at the high school, local high school. And um, she's always told me that it's different for my generation, but for you, as in me, that if you choose to put your mind to something, anything, you can accomplish it. You really just have to invest yourself. And so, um, since my mom left and I grew up with my grandparents, I had to do a lot for myself uh, as a child. So um, I learned to be independent and through doing the basic things in life, which, um, you know, that seemed challenging at a younger age. I learned that the, the more you do it, the better you get. And, and it gave me the confidence through the little things uh, the satisfaction of knowing that I can learn on my own, I can do them and be successful on my own. So, um, what I would say for everyone is, you know, get through small successes and build your confidence and life comes from, um, 
small successes. Yeah, confidence building exercises throughout our life. Yeah, I mean, so we just heard Jezebel, you know, grew up with her grandparents. I know we had talked about Jezebel and I talked the other day about mentors, and I know she really looks up to her grandmother. So thanks for sharing that. Um, Kristen, on the other hand, grew up with a different environment. Now, her father was a defense contractor, and believe it or not, her mother worked for the CIA. Well, that's interesting. And I know she had a lot of support from her family, including her brother. But Kristen, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your family. And I'm, I'm going to add another question into this. It sounds to me like you were really supported from your, you know, your inner inner family. What, mm -hmm. what advice would you have to somebody that didn't grow up with that kind of structure in their family? So those are kind of two part questions. Great, that's a great question, Debbie. So, um, so I think yes, I was very, very fortunate to have um, a, a very supportive and and loving family. And there were two things that my parents consistently told my brother and, and me growing up. The first one was, you can do anything that you set your mind to. And uh, similar, Jezebel, to to what you just shared with us, uh, I think it's really, really important to to know that you can you can do anything that you set your mind to. And the second part of that, um, which they didn't always come together, was that if you're going to do something, do it right. So I can remember um, on more than two hands, I can count the number of projects that I started that I didn't finish or that I sort of did halfway or that were kind of to par. And my parents would sit me down and say, nope, if you, you know, if you choose to do this and you're going to do it, you're going to do it right. And they would make me finish, walk it through and do the best that I could do. So I, I think those are two things that have really stuck with me and and really kind of shaped how I look at the world. I, I think even we all, as Jezebel said, we all have those those times when we're a little bit nervous or apprehensive or we don't always feel so confident. But I think because of those voices, my, my parents aren't here with me every day telling me if you can do anything you set your mind to, but that's in my heart and I hear them every day. So oh, I, I think then, then Debbie, to your kind of to your second question, I think we can all create those voices for ourselves as well, right? I think we can because when I hear them every day telling me these things, it's my memory, but it's me telling myself, Kristen, you can do anything you set your mind to, and I believe that, and you know, and motivating myself and and remembering that if I am going to do something, I need to do it right, I need to finish it, and I need to um, do the very best that I can do. So I, I think we can all. Even those of us maybe who who didn't have quite that level of support growing up, I think we can create that for ourselves today. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing your perspective on that. Moving to Denise, uh, you I would define as a Renaissance woman who could do about anything you wanted to do. And I know you're undeniably driven. Uh, where did this drive come from? And what's your recommendation here for others? Well, thank you for that kind. Uh, question, Debbie, and that, that uh, mm -hmm. support. I appreciate that. Uh, so it's interesting. It's a different question that you just asked Kristen and Jezebel, uh, but my answer um, is very much along the lines of what they just talked about with Jezebel's grandparents and what they instilled in her, Kristen's family and that um, that support system. And, and they both talked about um, you know, we have that inner voice that sometimes we talk ourselves out of things or we talk Kind of talk down at ourselves and in, in, in kind of a, a similar but different um, vein. Um, when I was in college at Michigan State senior year, I lost my mother and um, she was an artist and somebody that uh, instilled in me the love for, the, for art and culture and um, was obviously a really difficult time in my life. And the one thing that I really remember from that that time in my life was um, that out of that was born a single question that's my voice that um, I don't know that it drives me per se, but it helps me make the really big decisions in my life when I'm maybe terrified <laughs> to make them. The, the question is because my mom died so young, she was only 44 years old. Um, there were so many things she still wanted to do in her life. She wanted to go back to school to be an interior designer, et cetera. 
The question I've asked myself ever since then, when I have to make a difficult decision, and the last big one was two years ago, deciding to launch the startup, and then last September leaving Comcast, is will I wish I would have tried? Oh, that's my that question. Down. Let's write that down. Will I wish I would have tried? That's my, that's, you know, uh, Chris, Kristen talked about her true north. This is, I guess, a little bit of my guiding star. Um, if I answer, I will regret not trying, I do it. I sometimes fail, but I never look back with any regrets. And so I would just. Can you hear her or is it just me that I can't hear her? I think we lost her, lost audio. Yeah, I know yeah. she's back. We lost you, Denise. <laughs> We're back. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> We're at our farm. Our, we have a 10 meg down internet service here. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> we are the, uh, we're in the digital divide in, in the middle of Michigan. Anyway, um, yeah, so hopefully, hopefully that's helpful for, yeah. for others. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Will I wish I would have tried or will I regret it if I do? Will I regret it if I don't? But if you make that a mantra in life, mm -hmm. that, that's that's golden. I'm going to switch gears here and talk a little bit about emerging technology and the pandemic, okay? So we all know this world, this day has changed probably more than it has in a decade. And with three fabulous women here on this panel, there's a lot of advice I think they could give us. And, you know, we look at how the emerging technologies, whether it's automation, AI, ML, et cetera, have impacted our workforce and also your skill set. So that's one thing, but now adding in the pandemic with the new norm is another thing. It's a radically changed environment. Now, why it's so important today is that it puts everybody in a position to think about navigating uncharted waters. Mm -hmm. yeah, current job or, or elsewhere. Should they go to online classes? Should they be thinking differently? Uh, Denise, I'm just gonna stick with you for just one second. Turn it right back to school and you did it intentionally, would you mm -hmm. recommend that people look at maybe an AI class right now or, or anything along that to improve their skill sets? Um, absolutely. I think um, uh, especially online education has advanced so much um, in the last several years that, again, thinking about that blank artist canvas and thinking about where do you see yourself in, say, three years, are there skill sets you could augment through online education. Are there skill sets that you could augment by taking a crazy idea to somebody like Kristen at Cisco and say, Kristen, I have an idea. Um, I did that at STARS in, uh, in, early, in the early 2000s. STARS did not have a website. Uh, the leadership at that time did not believe in the power of digital uh, as a channel, both for connecting the brand to consumers um, and I went and I asked our CMO if I could launch the company's first website. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, but I really believed in the power and the future and the potential of it. And now, 20 years later, I've launched a, um, you know, a digital platform uh, media business. So I think that's thinking like an entrepreneur. And I think there's companies I know at Tech Mahindra, this company loves out of the box thinking. Who went to them and said, let's launch a website, e-commerce site. They hadn't even thought about it yet. Good for you. Yeah. And again, I think it shows a lot of your confidence that brought you to be able to launch town this year. So thanks. That's fabulous. Uh, Jezebel, now, do you think that there's any specific professions people should look at right now in the technology skill set world that would help them? Cloud well, <laughs> there's a there's a lot. Yeah. Um, there's many different areas, but you know the only advice that I would say is um, be authentic, right? It, really dig deep in trying to understand what it is that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. There's no particular technology that isn't going to change. Uh, that what you learn today isn't going to be different a couple of years from now. So, you know, we talked about, I, I, I talked about curiosity. So have that curiosity inside of you 
and continuous learning. You know, Denise talked about you know wanting to learn something new, believing in something. You know, have that vision, have that passion, and believe in it. And the learning comes along the way because, especially in technology, things change constantly and changes quickly. So you know. Don't give up on the learning just because what you learned today, um, you know, is out of date. It doesn't mean that what you know you learn tomorrow isn't going to be. So the entire experience uh, should be a learning experience, and at the same time, you know, forge that authenticity and believing in your own vision forward and building something that may be different than what it is today, and that is not. Uh, what other people see, but it could be something that's really special. Mm -hmm. That was really helpful. Thank you. I'm going to jump into another topic since we only have a few minutes left. And Kristen, I want to talk to you for a minute about your voice. Uh, we know that communicating is is key, but we could walk in a room and fill it, or we could be deliberate with our communication. And I have noticed uh, a difference between men and women when it comes to whiteboarding. And then that might be a bit of a narrow topic, but I find it really interesting because it's <laughs> such an interesting way to communicate one's point. So can you tell us a little bit about your perspective on using this tool to communicate? Like I said, it's one thing to show it, it's one thing to say it, but some people can learn differently. And there are differences between men and women that would love to hear your point of view. Yeah, that's right, Debbie. And I think, um, you know, it is an interesting topic and it becomes a little bit more challenging in the virtual world. Um, although there are a number of new virtual tools that are um, existing and new virtual tools that are popping up for us to do some of these things and visualization online, which is awesome. But, um, but I think you're, you know, kind of finding your voice is, is hard for, it's not maybe hard for everyone, but I'll say that it was, it, it's always been a challenge for me. It's always been something that I've worked at. And I think one of the things that, one of the things that makes it hard, I think, is just being an, I'm a little bit on the introverted side of the introverted <laughs> extroverted scale. So I think that just, you know, it takes a lot of energy. Um, and what I've learned, and I'm, I'm also not someone who sort of feels like I need to speak just to be heard. So I, because of that, I, I think sometimes it's a little bit more challenging or you have to work a little bit harder to to have your voice heard and to really be a part of the conversation. But but I'm glad that you talked about being deliberate because um, in some of the strategies that I've kind of worked out to overcome that, one of them is to be very deliberate with your communication, know your audience, understand the learning styles. And I, I do think there's, um, there are some differences, I think, with men and women, with people in engineering disciplines and, and other disciplines. Um, there are people who learn better more visually and, and more audibly. So, so I think just taking all these things into consideration, not being afraid to go up to the whiteboard and if you have something to say or if you want to express an idea, draw it. And that does a couple of different things. One is that it it helps other people kind of work through the idea. Being on a whiteboard forces you to sort of go step by step through a process of thinking, whether it's linear or if you're doing something a little bit more abstract, it allows people to, to sort of translate what you, what you think and feel in your head onto something that they can connect to. So I think that's a really important aspect of it. Um, it does appeal to those visual learners, but the other thing it does is that it, it also a whiteboard is something you can erase, right? So it sometimes when when people stand up and want their voices heard and they talk about their ideas, it's hard to take that back. But when you're on a whiteboard, people don't necessarily sort of feel as married to things because you can riff on things and you can erase this and draw that. And it it's right. just kind of a, a nice way to connect with each other um in in a in a way that that kind of oh, inspires innovation maybe in, in some of that creative thinking. Kristen, I think that was that was just wonderful to hear. I always take a picture of the whiteboard so it doesn't I do too. <laughs> uh, I have thousands of whiteboard <laughs> pictures on my phone. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna thank everybody here. Uh, but I want to turn this over to Submit so he can close and thank you again. Submit, are you there? Yeah, very much here. Thank you so much, Kristen, Jezebel and Denise for speaking today and discussing all of these varied topics. It truly was an honor to have you with us today.
If I were to sum it up, taking a leap from three powerful storytellers that we just heard from, every transition reflects the new and old relationships that we cherish, celebrate life with grace, and have courage in doing something, as they say, a decision not taken, perhaps a bad decision. With that, I would also like to thank our moderator, Debbie Astrid, for being such a gracious presenter, especially in the middle of the move. And Aishwarya, marketing guru, for putting this event together. And lastly, I want to thank the guests for attending. Before I let everybody go, I want to let you know that there'll be another session in the Women in Tech series next month. We'll be sending more information on the theme and how to sign up as soon as possible. Till then, as uh, Jezebel very ably said, let's practice the three C's. Stay curious, courageous, and compassionate. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.